QuickBooks Desktop 2023, company preferences, reminders, and reports and graphs. Let's do it with Intuit's QuickBooks Desktop 2023. Support accounting instruction by clicking the link below, giving you a free month membership to all of the content on our website, broken out by category, further broken out by course. Each course then organized in a logical, reasonable fashion, making it much more easy to find what you need than can be done on a YouTube page. We also include added resources such as Excel practice problems, PDF files, and more like QuickBooks backup files when applicable. So once again, click the link below for a free month membership to our website and all the content on it. Here we are in QuickBooks Desktop, Get Great Guitars a practice file that we set up in prior presentations. If you're following along with another practice file, that's okay because we're basically just going through the preferences which can be found in the edit dropdown preferences down below, noting that it's useful to look through a company file that has just been set up such as this one as we go through the preferences so we can note what the default preferences are and when those preferences might need to be changed depending on the type of company that we are working with. Going into those preferences, last time we left off on the payroll, so this time we're going to the, to the reminders and then we're going to the reports and graphs. Starting with the reminders, we've got the my preferences, nothing there. The company preferences is where we are at. Now, a lot of these reminders are can be useful in practice, but one, they can also be a little bit annoying sometimes. So you might wanna turn them off or go through here and decide which reminders are really relevant to you. And then two, when you're using a practice problem, then the reminders often aren't as useful because of the time frame of the practice problem might not be in real time as you're entering data in real time. Three, remember that if you are entering data into the system, you might still not be entering the data in real time, even if you're working in practice. In other words, you might be doing a bookkeeping or accounting process in real time, entering data as they happen, or for example, you might be in a situation where you're doing bookkeeping for someone that needs a whole year's worth of bookkeeping done into the system as best we can get it so that we can file the tax return at the end of the year or something like that. In which case, again, the reminders can be a bit of a burdensome problem because a lot of the transactions you're entering aren't being entered you know, in real time. That said, let's go through them here. We've got the up top, we got show summary, uh, show list and don't remind. And then we've got the items on the left hand side. So check to print. So note that if you have uh, checks that you're gonna be printing in QuickBooks, you still have to like buy the external checks. And when you enter the information into the system, you can have the checks to be printed. And then it could give you reminders, you know, to, to print the checks. So I'm gonna take that off. I don't wanna be reminded of that. You've got the days to be re reminded, days before check date. So you could enter the checks you know, early and then have them remind you on the check dates, which could be a good system depending on your circumstances. Uh, checks to print, and these are the paychecks. So similar kind of things, they're still checks in essence, but these are special, you know, processes. The process is different, it's a paycheck. I'm gonna once again, turn that off. Invoices, credit memos to print. So you might be making invoices that are going out uh, to somebody else and credit memos, mainly invoices you would expect and once again, you might be having them to be printing later and set them up. So maybe you print them at the same time and send them out or something like that. We're gonna be thinking of sending out the invoices as we go, those being the document representing that you made a sale on account and are gonna receive payment in the future. I'm gonna turn that off. Uh, overdue invoices. So that's one where now the invoice is, is past due. So that could be a useful one, giving you a reminder, helping you to track you know, and collect but I'm gonna turn that off for the practice promise problem. Almost due invoices, so 15 days before the due date. And then, and so that one's, I don't have the, op, it's faded out here, so we're gonna keep that as is. Sales receipts to print. So now we've got the sales receipts document, which is going to be this item, the other, the other income reporting item on more of a cash-based system. Once again, I'm gonna turn that off sales orders to print we don't have that uh, here we got the inventory to record reorder so inventory to reorder so if we're tracking the inventory in the system 
we then can be thinking about, you know, what if the inventory gets low and we can set up various reminders to basically remind us to be ordering the inventory. I'm going to turn that off. Uh, bills to pay. So we've got the bills to pay, entering the bills over here and then paying the bills uh, over here and say bills to pay. I'm going to say days before the due date. So it could be a useful reminder, but normally I think you'd be checking the bills if you're working real time, but it could be a useful tool. I'm going to turn it off because we're not working real time and I don't usually use it in any case. Memorize transactions due. So we can you can get all into uh, these memorized transactions that can make things a little bit easier. But uh, and I think we have a section on that that you can we kind of specialize on that, but I'm going to turn that off. Um, money to deposit, going to turn that off. So you've got the purchase order. So the notice that we might have money that we received from like receive payments and, and create sales receipts that then need to go into the deposit area and some kind of reminder could be helpful there possibly. Purchase orders to print. That's on the purchasing side. Purchase order would only be used if you're buying inventory uh, and you have an inventory system. And not only are you buying inventory, but you're in a system where you can kind of request the inventory. They ship it to you before you actually build the inventory. And then you'd be dealing with the purchase orders and you can have a, you could deal with that, but I'm going to turn it off uh, to, uh, to do notes. And once again, I'm going to turn those off. So all those are off and we could take it back to the default if you wanted to so if you go into these preferences and you want to see what the defaults are you can return them to the default if you so choose let's go to the reports and graphs now i'm going to save the changes it says you made changes do you want to save them that's basically what it says i'm paraphrasing and i'm going to say yeah this one we're going to go to the my preferences first so we're in the reports and graphs my preferences so prompt me to modify report options before opening a report so I would typically like it to do that automatically. So I think the default of that being off is, is what most people would generally prefer. Uh, when a report or graph needs to be refreshed, prompt me to refresh, uh, prompt me to refresh. So it could you know ask you to refresh, refresh automatically. I think this one would probably be best. I would kind of prefer to just, to just refresh automatically. Uh, I think the reports themselves generally do refresh automatically even when i'm on that default but i would have it refresh automatically don't refresh click help for information about refreshing a large report and graphs only draw graphs in 2d faster uh, use patterns so we can do the 2d graphs or the 3d graphs uh, when you're when you're looking at the graphs let's go to the company preferences we've got the summary report basis in accrual or cash now this option notice that you might be saying hey look i do a cash based system so maybe i want to report my stuff by cash meaning if i close this out i'm going to say okay i'm going to maximize the home page and if you go into your reports drop down company and financial and open like a profit and loss for example date and well it doesn't really matter if i because there's nothing in the report right now but notice that it's on an accrual basis here as opposed to a cash basis you might say well i should have it on a cash basis as my normal basis because i enter data on a cash basis notice that normally unless you talk to an to an accountant that has a good reason for why you would go to an accrual to a cash basis on the report you still want them reported on a cash basis even if you're entering data on an accrual basis because if i go back to the home page really whether you're on a cash basis or accrual basis will depend on your entering data process and you could be on a cash basis for like the vendor cycle and an accrual basis in essence for the customer cycle or vice versa so in, in other words if you're down here on the revenue cycle if you just basically have gig work and you wait till something clears the bank like you have a youtube revenue or something like that and then it clears the bank and you record it as a deposit possibly with bank feeds then then you're just using a deposit form you're entering the data into the system on a cash basis in that way even further than a cash basis system because you're not actually doing a you're not entering it with a sales receipt would still be a cash basis but notice the report will still be reporting on a cash basis because you're you're basically entering the data on a cash basis if on the other hand you're in the type of company where you have to do the work enter an invoice track the receivable then you're using an accrual basis and you're going to have to enter an invoice and so 
that means that this little toggle here isn't really the determining factor as to whether you're on a cash basis or not. It's really, are you using accrual processes in the system? So why do they have this toggle? It could be, it could be useful to convert you know, uh, your accrual reports to a cash report, meaning if I, if I use invoices and bills, I'm gonna end up with accounts receivable and accounts payable, accrual accounts. And if I toggle over to, to a cash basis on the report, it's not gonna report the income that I normally would record with an invoice until I receive the payment. So it'll kind of convert it to an accrual basis. So that's kind of an interesting uh, toggle. Uh, and maybe you have tax implications with it, you know, because you're reporting stuff on a, on a cash basis, on an accrual basis, but for taxes, you're on a cash basis. Uh, something like that could be an issue with your tax returns and so on. But uh, normally you would keep it on, on an accrual basis and also note that you have the statement of cash flows to help you to see the actual cash flows. So you can see it on an accrual basis and then you got the statement of cash flows which is supposed to then give you that added information about the cash flows. Okay, that's enough of that for now. We'll go to the edit preferences and then reports. So I'm going to keep it accrual is the bottom line after all that. Aging reports. So age from due date, age from the transaction date. Typically, you're going to put the aging reports from the due date. That's going to be the accounts receivable aging and the accounts payable aging because that's when the money is actually owed uh, to you. So that's the typical custom. We'll keep that. Reports show items by name only, description only, name uh, and description. When we're looking at items, we're thinking inventory items and service items typically. And I think, you know, we'll keep the default typically of having the name and the description. In, when you enter the item, you enter the name of the item, and then you have a description field that you can enter as well. So in some cases, you might have a short name for the item to make it a shorter length. Sometimes you might have the same name as well as the description. The description is what will actually be in the reports on invoices and whatnot when you when you fill out an invoice and then you have an inventory or service item it'll populate uh the description there on the reports we'll have the name and the description okay so reports show accounts by name description name and description so when we enter an account into the system we usually just enter a name that in that case so in other words if i went to the list and chart of accounts Notice we've got the name of the account and then the account type. That's the essential information when you enter an account. Uh, if I was to add a new account, I'm not going to actually add it, but if we just kind of go through the process, we got the account type here. Let's just choose an expense account and then go next. And then you've got the name. That's usually what you're going to be showing stuff by, but you can also put a description down here. The description field isn't required. It's usually the case that you're going to be demonstrating it or showing it, showing on a report by the name, not the description. So, and then you might have account numbers that we talked about in a prior presentation. We won't be dealing with those this time in this practice problem. Edit drop down preferences again. So there is that statement of cash flows, classify cash. Now the statement of cash flows is one of the primary reports. You got the balance sheet, you got the income statement or profit and loss, and then the statement of cash flows. And then all other reports are typically going to give you some added information, added detail, expand upon one or multiple line items of the main two reports, the balance sheet and the income statement or profit and loss. The statement of cash flows, although it's a major financial statement report, you can think about it as kind of a, a subsidiary report in that you're kind of converting from an accrual basis if you're on an accrual basis to kind of a cash basis with the statement of cash flows. But it's also taken a step further than that in that it's kind of reconciling the net income on, on, the, on the income statement on an accrual basis to what the net income kind of would be if under a cash basis. So therefore, you, when you're actually creating the reports, if you were to do it by hand, you would typically make the balance sheet and the income statement as you do financial transactions, meaning you enter the forms, which enter journal entries into the general ledger. It creates the trial balance. The trial balance creates the balance sheet and the income statement. And then at the end of the period, month, quarter, year, you might then make the statement of cash flows based on the balance sheet and the income statement. So in other words, you're not typically constructing the statement of cash flows as you enter the data into the system 
you're taking the end result that you have constructed as you enter the data, balance sheet, income statement, or profit and loss to make uh, the statement of cash flows, which is gonna try to give you that information on a cash flow basis. Uh, but because of that, it it's, 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 can be a little bit confusing to actually construct the statement of cash flows. It, it's gonna take the difference in the balance sheet accounts basically. And if you go into here, it can help you to kind of see where the classifications are for the three components of the statement of cash flows, operating, investing, and financing. You can see it basically takes the change in the balance sheet accounts down to here because these are income statement accounts. And then, and that's how it kind of constructs the, the statement of cash flows. It's not a perfect system this way, but it does give you something that will pretty much always tie out to basically the balance sheet cash account. And so if you want to learn more about the statement of cash flows and how to construct it, it really helps you understand the double entry accounting. If you can actually make a statement of cash flows, then it really helps you understand the double entry accounting system. We have a whole course on that in more detail, but that can help you to classify the accounts. Default formatting uh, for reports, so we'll keep that there. Collapse transactions, select this checkbox to combine. Collapse multiple items in a transaction into a single line. So when you're entering data, this will make it the data as slim as possible to enter the, the information into the system, although you'll lose some of the added uh, fields that might be there if you, if you didn't have that collapsed. I typically keep it uncollapsed. You can do some of your data input if you so choose and test out uh, whether or not it'd be faster for you to kind of collapse here, but I'm gonna keep the defaults as they are on this one. So let's close that out. We're gonna continue on with our preferences and future pre presentations.